uh, the latter try to uh, urge the European Commission to some measures and then you get the response. Um, they try to, to share these two or three uh, most important. And I would like to, to, to ask to Maria Manuel and also Tim, um, if um, since you are in, in different perspectives involved uh, with this subject, um, when you, you, you hear and you get to know this response and, and these, uh, let's say, more immediate initiatives uh, or commitment from uh, the European Commission, would you agree uh, that these uh, are the most relevant topics for, for the moment? Would you, would you like to, to reinforce or to recess out something more? Let me begin by asking to Maria Manuel. And your microphone is it's off. Sorry. Uh, of course, I think uh, the member states and commission are doing their best in, in this moment. And, and sometimes I, I, I'm really surprised because uh, after a very bad week at the beginning, the commission is answering to the to the pressures, uh, helping uh, people and helping uh, uh, our um, economic ecosystem. Um, but there is some problems. Uh, there, there was some problems before the crisis, and they and, and they continue uh, during the crisis relating to startups. If you, uh, I read the letter you you, you share with me uh, from uh, uh, the president of Commission von der Leyen, and um, in the letter it was referred only once to startups. Um, and uh, the letter is, is re was written in a way uh, that it seems that uh, the Commission uh, didn't differentiate startup from Smith. It, it's the same, and it was not the same. Looking at, uh, for instance, one of the Commission priorities that is digital transformation. Uh, and there are uh, there, there in, in the new MFF um, uh, probably if it will, if it is approved there there will be um, support to digital transformation because it's one of the main priorities uh, for the European Union in the moment. So it's a totally different support micro companies, SMEs or startups. Startups are not digital uh, excluded. There is other problems. They, they are innovative, uh, considering digital transformation. In the other side, there are differences, but there are SMEs that need to be digital, that are not digital for mo the moment, so need to be included in the digital world or more included in the digital world. And there is the problem of micro companies that is a specific problem because we need to include and to keep them in, in the digital world. It's only an, an, an example why we need probably, and I think we are going to discuss this point in, during this, uh, this last session, um, how can as MEP and other MEPs uh, help uh, startup ecosystem uh, to, um, to be considered as startup with these specificities? And so for that, it's important to work with this kind of associations the umbrella of national association as Startup Portugal and the others. Uh, first of all, in the specific definition for startup, um, main reasons and practical implication, for instance, for innovation policies and support funds, not support funds, not only in digital transformation, but other innovation areas. Um, and the, the, how can we define a startup in a way that distinguishes them from a SME. Uh, so we need to, 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 to do both, to uh, show evidence that is important to define a startup uh, or to distinguish startup from SMEs. And the other point is how can we define a startup? And this is, this is the main point to work. Um, the, the parliament uh, um, uh, uh, doesn't uh, have legislative power, as you know, but we can press the commission uh, and we can even uh, do uh, 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 an own initiative uh, uh, to, to that with uh, proposing 
a regulation or, 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 or a law or a communication uh, to the Commission on this point. And this is a very, very important point. If not, um, all the ecosystems, SMEs, plus startups, plus ma macro companies, or even other companies, uh, are going to apply to the funds in Horizon Europe uh, or other specific funds uh, in, equal, in, in equal positions. And, um, and, and so, uh, if we can uh, uh, support our innovative system, we need to, uh, to do that in a different way as we discussed in our previous session with mm -hmm. Alison. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm available uh, to help you in that job. We, we, I, I don't know if I succeed, but uh, we need to try. Uh, you know about innovation. Uh, normally I say people that innovate and all it's to seed is because they innovate very little. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we need to try, you need to risk to do that and we need to press the commission because this letter is the evidence that they don't know about the difference. Only once, it's a letter from startups and only once uh, referred startups. Always is uh, some uh, instruments, some tools, very good one, maybe startups can apply for them, uh, better than nothing, but it's first miss. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, Tim, I would like to have your intake because uh, we are talking about a very, um, let's say basic topic, but crucial topic. And being a journalist, uh, we know that we, uh, tell me if uh, eventually if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, it used to be more focused on um, explaining business model from startups or uh, investment rounds and so on. But for sure, uh, you have the opportunity to talk and get the perspective from different stakeholders. So it would be interesting to have your intake, like uh, why it's so, hard is, is this is only a matter of political will uh, it's just a matter of um contemporary understanding why it's so hard what does it take for us to move forward in this discussion and um put the things in, in, in the right place yeah i mean i think my answer to that would be that what you what i hear when i speak to startups in portugal and spain is this kind of anxiety that if action is not t taken at a European level, then it's left up to member states. And of course, if that happens, we've seen this already, the differing levels of support that are available in different economies, right? And in the last financial crash, the last time that Europe faced serious trouble, what we saw was that the south of Europe became incredibly vulnerable economically. And that is happening as we speak. And if you look at aid packages to tech and innovative companies in France and Germany and the UK, it's chalk and cheese with what you have in Portugal, who, to be fair, have done more than Spain as far as I can see. But um, I mean, looking at that kind of list of uh, list of things that Benedict mentioned about liquidity, tax deferment and furlough, those are, yeah, definitely three of the things that startups are really struggling with at the moment. There is less money in terms of investment. If you were looking to raise a round just before this crisis started, then you've had a lot of trouble. And there is just less activity. I mean, we, we're all in countries here that I've got a very booming tourist industry and a lot of startups related to the tourism industry. It's natural that if you want those businesses to stay alive, you need to do some kind of employee support scheme like the furlough. So I would say that, yeah, the European Union has a massive role to make sure that what we don't have is a very uneven Europe when it comes to innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, Benedict, would you like to, to, to add something else? No, I think that's that's spot on. Something we've um, said in numerous meetings with um, uh, politicians is that I think a startup shouldn't um, um, be more likely or have a higher chance of surviving just because it's based in France or you know in Portugal or Greece. It should be you know the the, the integrity of its business model and you know it's it's you know whether whether there's a market for it that decides and uh, not uh, if it is you know subject to the French aid package or to the Spanish one. And, and um, bear in mind that um, the, this is going to be particularly hard hitting for the smallest of the startups who are only based in one country. 
uh, the bigger players, um, you know, and the start the bigger startups as well will have a like higher uh, availability or a higher possibility to move and and see where you know and go go eight package shopping uh, if, if I can put it uh, put it that way, um, or even go outside of uh, the EU if it's even easier. But um, that's maybe painting a very big picture. I think the ambition should be for sure to to um, have if we didn't have a common entry strategy as Europe to have at least a common exit strategy um, yeah. as we come out of the crisis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, how could, uh, in, in your opinion, um, we have always two dimensions here, the European one and the country, the different countries um, level. Um, for sure, we can have a one size fits all uh, solution but some of, uh, of the topics of the more, most crucial ones, uh, they probably should be transversal. Um, and, and throughout this season, um, two key topics um, regarding digital innovation impact in society and, and, and business were on top for sure. Um, let's say artificial intelligence and the digital service act regulations. Um, I'd like to get, now, to, now that we are all together, uh, I think it's, it's interesting to get your, your personal perspectives um, on this. Uh, let's mm. start by, by the artificial intelligence thing, because uh, mm. probably you have the, the, the low and the, the high risk uh, thing here. Um, let me start by asking you uh, about this. What should be um, the crucial point or the crucial points uh, for us to have a fair uh, legislation in artificial intelligence in Europe? Is this the, the, the definition of what is a high risk and a low risk um, operation is the most crucial one and why? Or if you'd like to, 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 to highlight some, some other topic. Let's, uh, let me start by, to, by the, the ladies. Maria Monel, please, would like to, to share your uh, <laughs> uh, So it, 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 it's very important for me, uh, for me to hear from you on this point because now in the parliament, in all committees, we are discussing artificial intelligence. We are discussing artificial intelligence in the IMCO, the internal market community, in industry committee, in a, in a, a jury committee, legal committee. So um, in AMV, of course, that th this is the issue. And now we have even a subcommittee uh, to artificial intelligence with different uh, MEPs, uh, uh, I myself, I, I will be a member of this new new committee. So it's a very important, it's a central issue um, from different perspectives. And the, the most important is to show that um, artificial intelligence is not only uh, a, a issue of big companies uh, to get our data and, uh, and to make money with our data without our permission. Because there is a common sense among certain MEPs uh, that artificial intelligence is nothing more than that. So it's very important to show that artificial intelligence is a technology that can be used for good and for bad, and that can be used for health to control the pandemics, uh, to help us to control the pandemics. To, to improve public services, it what I have done in different events. Uh, I did that in Portugal, and I'm showing that in the Parliament how we can use artificial intelligence to better protect consumers, to improve market surveillance, and so on. This is a very crucial point before regulating to know more about uh, now the technological details, but about the technology, what artificial intelligence, and it serves for what? what, what can we do? We can improve governance, maybe we can simplify the access uh, uh, to European funds for uh, small business uh, in order to reduce administrative burdens using data and artificial intelligence uh, to, uh, to, to, to define a risk profile and, and to control the execution of funds. It's a very good application of artificial intelligence. For the moment, what we are discussing in the Parliament is about 
ethical principles. It's not about regulation. Uh, and also the idea that AI must always be human-centric and incorporate features like uh, privacy by design. But we do not exclude in the Parliament and also the Commission other kind of uh, regulation it become, if it becomes necessary in a second, a second phase. Uh, we, we are thinking about that uh, on a facial recognition technology and maybe other points could be in the future um, regulated. But uh, for the moment we are discussing on ethical uh, principles and how uh, to make them effective uh, by design, it's very important. And also we are discussing about transparency of algorithms, but this is a very difficult point because it's, it's, it's easy to say that algorithms must be transparent, but uh, uh, for instance, look at a, a consumer protection association, how can they uh, uh, they have no resources and competence and skills uh, to, to deal with these new realities. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning of your answer, um, it, it's interesting because uh, <laughs> you said that this is not even not even a, a regulation or a principles topic, but rather a, a, an awareness thing. Uh, getting to know what it is, how it works, why it's important. Um, Benedict, considering that you are involved the in a, in a policy crucial. making... Trust, trust. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, Benedict, considering that, you, that you're involved in a policy making um, organization, um, in your daily experience, do you agree? This is still, uh, we are in a very... Um, specific group of people or community um, facing this as a normal topic. We know that maybe for regular people, this is not a usual concept to be applied uh, on a daily basis. But are we facing still an awareness uh, thing here? I do think there is a conversation in that has to happen in public space where I think two years ago, we were in this bipolar conversation where it was either killer robots or we kind of save you know, save, save all panacea. And by now we know that it's just not that, that we are, when we're talking about AI, we are talking about a, a specific, uh, a, you know, narrow AI, which can do specific things, most repetitive tasks well. Um, I do think to, you know, build on the point that I was making before, we are probably a bit further than just talking about ethics. The parliament is talking about ethics, but of course the white paper from the commission is out. And I do think we will see regulation proposals and, Specifically on high-risk AI, there will be probably ex-ante uh, requirements, and um, that is where we um, we are very uh, 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 curious because we we also want to be cautious that uh, we don't uh, stifle innovation before it even happens. <clears throat> For us, the we think the aim should be that even if you're low or high risk in both fields, we want to make sure that startups can still innovate at the end of the day. Um, of course, they need a clear system and clear rules uh, to do so, but that should be the goal. And maybe to, to take, if you can give me a, a one minute to put it in a bigger picture. Sure. Um, President Macron used his Sorbonne speech uh, to say that entrepreneurs are no longer bound to one place, but instead they, are, they find the ecosystem which has the right mix of talent and, and, and capital uh, to maximize their chance of success. <clears throat> so if you ask me, um, um, what a good AI and a good DSA file would do. And um, I would ask, does it make it more likely that startup entrepreneurs will want to start up and scale up in Europe at the end of the day? Will it give them you know, additional legal certainty and clear rules to scale with, or will it end up being a, a complexifier? Um, that's the metric I would measure at the DSA and AI files against. Thank you, Benedict. Tim, um, what's your, your intake? You said an interesting thing in our conversation, uh, maybe so much related to what Benedict said, uh, which is, in your opinion, uh, we have a problem of clarity or uh, being simple when it comes to these uh, new topics for some people, not, not, not that new to the ones who are already involved. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. And that kind of just picking up on what Benedict was just saying is that really what people want is a kind of... Uh, 
a sort of a clear idea of where we're going with it so that people can make plans and that, you know, that innovation isn't stifled. Because I think with artificial intelligence, you know, essentially what it is, is a technology that can analyze a big data set or complex data, understand that data in some way and make an assumption or a decision based on it. And that can be used for good purposes or less good purposes. So, you know, I've been recently reporting on Spanish health tech companies, many of which use artificial intelligence to do things like compare symptoms or brain scans from patients and then use that to make decisions and assumptions about what kind of conditions they might have or might be likely to have in the future. And, you know, that's a massively positive kind of thing for, you, you know, health innovators, health professionals and doctors. So what we have to be careful is that applications like that don't get kind of stifled at the cost of trying to stop slightly more pernicious and sinister things such as facial recognition within advertising and we can all understand why that might worry some people. So it's tricky because it's such a wide-ranging technology but I think as uh, as was said earlier by Maria that by design this stuff has to be compliant with other data protection and privacy issues so you know if it can be compliant with gdpr and keep people's data private by design that's a huge benefit for people who are, will trust this i think trust is a huge thing as these technologies get developed as maria said mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. benedict please yeah i just wanted to to build on that um because we've had this experience with gdpr and, you know, a European principle-based legislation. And um, I mean, you know, the idea is great. And, it, you know, it, we are, I think, all for the better for having it. But I did, you know, we did notice that the implementation wasn't perfect because we set out principles and um, it was very hard for, especially the SMEs and the startups to understand, okay, so what does privacy by design in my company mean? And I was, you know, especially if you think of a startup, which is doing something innovative in a new way, you know, uh, you know, you can imagine that the Santanderas was able to talk to the Citibank, to able to talk to the Deutsche Bank about how to do privacy by design in their bank. But imagine you are building a, a chatbot based on, you know, using our, our AI uh, algorithms to, to, to train and learn how better responses could look like. And then you're uh, asked to do, okay, please be AI uh, uh, ethical standards by design. And, and this is going to be, a, a, you know, a, a, a challenge to make sure that startups have what they need when it comes to implementing something like this. Um, I can share a story from, from the GDPR implementation if you want, but I've probably you've heard these kind of stories before. So all I'd say is that the principles are great, but we will need to make sure that you take startups and SMEs by the hand uh, when, you, when you implement them. Thank you, Benedict. Um, I'm afraid you'd like to add something else, uh, Maria. Uh, yes, I, I forgot in my previous intervention uh, this, this, um, this situation that um, Benedict referred about high risk and low risk application. Uh, it becomes to be very important this distinction in the opinions of the parliament. For the moment we are discussing on opinions only, is not uh, mandatory regulation because there are no initiatives from, um, from the European Commission um, on, on, on AI, uh, uh, of course there are the communication, but no uh, legislative initiative. Um, so we are discussing on opinions, we are proposing our own uh, initiative reports on the matter, but it's very important because we are trying to discuss among us on um, some principles and one of them is very clear, high risk and low risk applications. Maybe after it will be difficult to say where is the high risk and low risk for some application, but there are others concerning uh, some fundamental rights, uh, um, maybe health data, uh, not all the health data, but uh, that, uh, we, that we can uh, distinguish between high risk and low risk application in order for the high risk maybe to regulate extent for the others um, uh, 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 access ex exposed and, and this, this is uh, this is of course a very important point the other point Benedict referred is very 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 is crucial is uh, um, a kind of regulation that is clear easy to apply to be effective 
and uh, also um, because for big companies is always clear is always easier easier because they have their own lawyers and so on you know about but for a startup with two three ten persons or the, uh, so many uh, so little people is very difficult to understand this regulation that is very difficult even for us to understand sometimes so we need clear principles clear guidelines if you want uh, to be um, effective concerning human centric um, uh, ai at the end of the day thank you maria so it, it probably uh... but but we, we but we need the collaboration we need to do that in a in a kind of co-design co-writing this kind of regulation and for this is very important to have startups on board because they are smart guys or smart girls and also gender balance is a very important principle concerning ai they are smart guys or smart girls very well qualified and they have the experience of everyday innovation and so it's very important to have them on board because we receive a lot of big companies and it's important as MEP to, uh, to hearing from them and to discuss with them. And we need to, to, to create, as I discussed with Alison, I don't know why, but we need to do that urgently uh, for, for these dossiers on digital and AI. All dossiers related to the uh, digital transformation. Thank you. Sorry. No problem at all. Um, you, you came up with a, with a topic with, which is co-designing legislation or regulation or even the principles. This can be a season by itself uh, because it's a way of uh, improving democracy, uh, uh, let's say. Um, Benedict, you have uh, experience in the recent past, uh, for instance, for uh, GDPR, um, uh, about uh, being involved uh, in listening to different voices um can you be optimistic about this kind of uh, approach just as maria monel said C can you expect uh that we can really co-design principles and regulations in the near future that's a big question i, I mean we're always optimistic and positive about it and um, i think the, the the process by which we are designing the the rules uh on ai it will be super important to have startup on board um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm thinking back to our experience with GDPR in that um, the, you know, when, for instance, the implementation was happening, um, the DPAs, the data protection authorities, who were also implementing and, and controlling at the end of the day, were also, you know, asked to um, go out to um, innovation ecosystems and you know, collaborate with them so they understand what the rules mean. And back in the day, we did a little experiment and we sent one letter of a general letter with some of the questions we had and an outreach request to every single DPA in Europe. So, you know, that was uh, plus the lender in Germany, we sent 60 letters out. We got 10 replies, five were, sorry, we're too busy, we're understaffed, and the other five were, um, absolutely, let's have a meeting. So um, what I'm getting to is, um, if we, you know, if we do a, a, a principle-based legislation on AI, there, it would be very important that the public authorities are well manned and have the resources to engage with startups and uh, make sure that uh, they know uh, and they have an open door. That's why we keep talking about sandboxes um, and not because it's something fuzzy that nobody really understands, it maybe happens in London, but because we are trying to think of ways through which startups have a, a more consistent dialogue with uh, the enforcers. Uh, so that they're not all the time trying to stay under the radar but they can you know they have someone to talk to and you know test out their business model and iterate it because startups are changing their business model often and uh, and be compliant from day one um as far as the process in brussels goes um and, and i know the honorable member will uh, to be able to kind of offer an inside perspective there it's it's a super complicated and 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 and, and sometimes a, a messy one because there are a lot of institutions and a lot of uh, players. So, um, of course, we will keep raising the flag for startups. Um, one of the tiny things I wanted to just mention here is that many, many legislations the Commission puts forward, there's an SME test to make sure the whole thing ends up working for Europe's SMEs. That's great. How about adding something like a scale-up test in Europe? So that if you have this new rule, 
uh, it's not just SMEs which uh, which can do well, but also a startup can still scale up across Europe and not maybe have a directive where you have 27 different legal regimes again, uh, like we've seen on on, on copyright. Um, so is you know is a new European rule making it also easier to scale up across Europe? That would be a, a great test we'd like to see included in some of the legislative proposals, like the DSA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Benedict. Um, Tim, I would like to have your, your intake as an observer, uh, as, a, as, a, as an analyst um, covering uh, this, um, not necessarily this topic, but this community. Uh, do you agree um, with Benedict and, and Maria Manuel? Would like to, to, to add something else? Yeah, I think Benedict is right to be optimistic. And the best example that I have for this is with the case of Hyperloop. I think we spoke about this last time. But perhaps this is an example of a technology which is so new that it's almost it almost has to be a dialogue between the policy makers and the innovators because there's a big reason that the European Union might want this, right? It improves connectivity. It kind of, you know, for people who don't know what Hyperloop is, it's basically an alternative to high-speed rail that they hope will cut down journey times massively for short-term distances, which will mean less people need to fly. And obviously the European Union, which is invested in environmental sustainability, but also connectivity, it's a great kind of technology that could make a lot of sense for the EU. And when I speak to startups and founders who are working in this space, they're very positive about the kind of dialogue they have with European policymakers. And as I say, perhaps that is due to the fact that it's such a kind of, it's not like something like copyright where we have a huge precedent for what that should be. You know, it's not like we have a previous hyperloop regulation that we're building on. I think when it comes, so this is, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's a sense that the European Union can be responsive and reactive when it needs to be. And that makes it all the more frustrating in areas where it doesn't, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, Benedict and Maria, um... Would you like to, to give some more perspective on this uh, from what Tim's, um, Tim said? I, I would like to comment this idea of scale-up tests. Um, we need to work on this idea because it could be a good idea at the end of the day is the cost to work in the internal market. If I, if, I, if I start in one country, I would like to scale up my activity to the other countries that is uh, to be a player in the internal market, how it costs in terms of administrative burdens related to my activity. Uh, this is a problem because we have a very good internal market for, for goods, but we have not a very good internal market for services. Um, uh, commission tried to do that with service directive uh, and uh, single points of contact but I know there is a lot of problems uh, in a very, very clear um, single points of content uh, available to SMEs and, uh, and startups. So um, I don't know how to do. I, I know about uh, SMEs tests. Uh, I, I don't know how to do this scale up test, but um, I feel this is a very, very interesting idea we can explore together and it's very important to do that with startups instead of do that with big companies that are interested in doing business all over the Europe. For them, maybe it's a cost, but it's not a problem. So it's very important this approach uh, in partnership with the startup ecosystem. So Benedict, once more, I ask you to, to be in touch. It's a, my interest to be in touch because I can do that in the internal market committee when I am vice president. That, that, that sounds already like a great takeaway. And I'm just going to um, add on. Um, I, one of the reasons we mentioned this is because, you know, SMEs are, 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 of course, super important for the European economy. And there's nothing against an SME test. But oftentimes, a solution that regulators find, uh, especially when there is complicated legislation, is to make an exemption for SMEs. And, and that might be great for the SMEs, but every exemption is a glass ceiling for a startup, which is trying to scale up, right? So if you make, and if you, if you come up with a set of European rules where you have um, 
uh, 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 you know, classics for a 50 people headcount or this much revenue or these many users, um, then you're making a lot of stepping stones and hurdles for scaling up in Europe. And that's why this idea of a, of a, a scale up test is something um, yeah, we, we've been working on. And um, I mean, something that could be done, for instance, is to kind of push the issue a bit more from the parliament, for instance, through an own initiative report or questioning the, the commission on this. For instance, on the Digital Services Act, we will also be you know, curiously following if there will be kind of exemptions that might at the end of the day make it harder for startups to scale up across the Europe, um, across Europe. So it's um, it's an idea I'd be happy to take uh, forward after the, the conversation. So um, I'm amazed to see that our mission, part of our mission uh, is being accomplished as um, collaboration for innovation. Uh, we just have an example in real time. Uh, but I'd like to I'd like to move forward um, and and ask Tim about the Digital Service Act. Uh, I had the impression uh, while talking uh, about artificial intelligence that before, just as Maria Monel said, before the regulation, we have the principles. Uh, maybe this, uh, this is an easy uh, answer, uh, but the Digital Service Act is even broader, let's say, uh, than artificial intelligence. And would you say, Tim, that again, um, outcomes to um, privacy, data access, um, make sure that people you have the privacy uh, guaranteed. Is this again the starting point, even for this dimension of regulation for digital uh, digital innovation? I mean, I think with the Digital Services Act, I, I totally kind of understand the reasons for doing it. And if you look at how these kind of tech giants have sort of monopolized certain areas of our digital lives, it totally makes sense for the European Union to do something about that. And you know, in a way, it's similar to artificial intelligence in that one thing we're not really sure about at the moment is the size of organizations and how they're going to be regulated. So while it might make sense for Facebook, one of the biggest providers of information in the world to have to monitor the kind of stuff that goes up on their platforms and they can afford to do that, there are other smaller startups that don't necessarily have the resource to do that. So. Benedict actually contributed to a piece that we had in Sifted on this. I think he said um, that either startups are at the table or they're on the menu, which I thought was quite a good line. Um, but what in that article, an, another contributor was um, a policy lead at SoundCloud. SoundCloud's a startup that I particularly like as a music lover. It's done great stuff. And they're really worried that if they have to employ a lot of people who are constantly moderating content, that that's not going to work for them. And I think we have to keep in mind, you know, it's kind of, as we were saying earlier, we have to keep in mind what the policy and the principle was, but not be too blanket about how that's applied and make sure that while we try and improve people's relationship as a digital citizen, we don't also massively damage the things that people enjoy about being a digital citizen, which are numerous. Thank Just you, Tim. Uh, add on that. Um, Please, I think the Digital Services Act has a lot of potential to update uh, the e commerce uh, directive framework from over 20 years ago. Um, the country of origin principle, for instance, is under siege, for instance, through you know online harms in the UK or NetSIG in Germany. And we have a great opportunity to work with the Commission and European policymakers to create a common system on some of these things. Um, I think what, what uh, Tim was getting to is, is something that we are concerned about in that often we think about these big problems through some of the big companies. And you know, the EU Platform Observatory listed over 10,000 platform startups in Europe. And you know, but in, in Portugal, I, I know Uni Places, which is a marketplace for student accommodation, or E Solidar, which is an online in charity fundraising, uh, uh, you know, crowdfunding community, they are fully in the scope. And, um, and you know, I'm sure you know, it can't be the intention that these, uh, these amazing platforms um, 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 have a harder time basically operating their service. So whatever, whatever um, you know, rules we end up talking about, and as you said, it's a really big field. I think the ambition should be for the uni places and the e-solidars to have a clear set of rules uh, to, to scale up in Europe uh, through. Thank you, Benedict. Maria Manuel, for, totally sure, for sure your input is super important here. 
and oh no, I totally agree with, with Benedict. Uh, and, uh, and I would like to, to, to highlight that when we talk about innovation, we need to include the uh, impact innovation and the social innovation. And we have very, very good examples in Portugal and uh, of, of course also on, on digital projects, on, on platforms for that. And uh, it's true that in the parliament, when we speak about platforms, we think on Facebook, on Amazon, and uh, and, and so on. We, we think on the big, the big platforms, <coughs> on competition problems, on consumer protection problems against these big p platforms. And uh, and uh, it's very important when we design legislation, as it was in the GDPR, that we think that, of course, there are big platforms with uh, some problems, uh, also, they can solve some problems easier than sometimes small platforms. And there are small platforms with different situations. Platforms as companies are different. Also, in platforms, well, there are the biggest one and smallest one. Uh, so, um, for the DSCA, what you, uh, what one, one of the most important principles we are discussing is that the same rules should apply online and offline. Uh, and uh, giving consumers the same level of protection online and offline. It's not easy to do that, but it's very important to update uh, e-commerce directive and we are discussing to update other directives, for instance, product safety directive that is uh, Mm, uh, uh, relate that share the same principles and of course maybe product li li uh, liability regime that is from uh, uh, 1985 I think so uh, from a world totally different and uh, also um, platforms have to respect European legislation regardless of where uh, they are established is also one of the principles uh, to include in DSCA. I, I don't know about origin of origin principle. It is a big discussion uh, inside the parliament. Um, and uh, also to, to avoid winner takes all situation that is protecting uh, startups uh, ecosystem, uh, giving time to, to, to start up um, ecos to, uh, to startups to, to, to develop their, their project. And of course, unfair tax competition, but this is another 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 uh, issue not in the SCA uh, uh, Service Act, uh, in Digital Service Act. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you came up uh, with this approach because from the corporates or the service providers perspective, um, it's pretty common not to say almost uh, a universal approach to talk about a seamless experience during the journey or the relationship with a brand or a service or with a product and why couldn't we have the same when it comes to c consumer rights or legislation itself um, so um, it is good that you came up with this uh, because it's again um, and giving back the, the, the word to, to, to Tim just to, to, to finish this, this topic um, it's a way to get things simpler to, to people because otherwise you have to face okay what about my rights on a brick and mortar business what about my rights on a digital platform and if you try to streamline this not easy task at all uh, but it's a step forward to to have a, a simpler um, relationship between these stakeholders I don't know Tim if you'd like to 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 add something else in this topic before we we move into to to our, our wrap up uh, Alison, I'm really sorry, but I have to leave now, just as I thought we were doing um, 60 minutes from half past. I've got a train to get on. Um, oh, God. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I was I, afraid you have more 20 minutes or half an hour. No, I'm sorry. I've just got the one hour slot, which we discussed originally. Um, but you're in very safe hands with um, Maria and Benedict. So I'm happy that that's the case. Um, Anyway, thank you very much for having me. And there were some very interesting points and I'd encourage all of your viewers to subscribe to Sifted to stay up to date with European Startup News. And yeah, thank you for having me and for the other guests' contributions.
Oh, for sure. Tim, thank you for being with us. Um, well, have, a, Thanks, have a safe travel. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. I only recommend Sifted as well. And I would just add, uh, uh, because the question was kind of bouncing. Uh, sorry, uh, Tim, I'm just trying to, yeah. <laughs> um, I was just going to add that because you were mentioning the, the process of legislation, uh, sometimes compared to startups and how startups work. And I think on the Digital Services Act, I think we also need to be remembering that in the la at the end of the last mandate, we passed, or the European Union passed the platform to business regulation. And that is actually in the process of being implemented right now. So, and this is sometimes when I speak to startup entrepreneurs, they ask me, you know, hey, you're, there's something in the pipeline and you're already working on something new. Um, we don't even know how this uh, first platform to business regulation will look like in the field. Uh, and, and we're going on with something else. And, and um, it's, it's um, you know, startup entrepreneurs often, they build something and then they iterate. So they see how it works in the field and then they make changes. And it's, um, it's something uh, we are always uh, uh, put, uh, suggesting is to, to let's not forget that we also have a P2B uh, regulation in the pipeline, which addresses certain things like ranking and transparency. Um, and that's something our ecosystems are actually working on in the countries where this is already uh, kind of a past international law as well. Uh, just pointing it out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So please, Maria. Uh also, I see that there are some papers on competition policy where uh, digital matters are being discussed in a different way, uh, for instance, with implication on measures, because sometimes uh, the acquisitions uh, from a big platform of a, a small platform or, or even a startup is not a measure, ex ante. Uh, uh, fr from the, the, the law point of view or from the measure regulation point of view in this moment, but maybe we need to extend in order to prevent winners takes all uh, the control, uh, measures control, extend the measures control to this situation. It, it's only a discussion that is open this, this discussion in the Commission and also in the Parliament uh, relating to competition policy to the digital in the digital world in a, or or in, in this world of, of platforms. Also taking into consideration the big platforms again <laughs> and not relations uh, between the small ones. On on, on any position, please we have a very interesting um, discussion ahead of us because it's one of these areas where we we still, um, I think, as a startup association, have a lot of sharing to do with uh, the policy world about how a startup life cycle sometimes works. So oftentimes, startups are founded by entrepreneurs uh, to be the next unicorn, to be number one. You know, they don't necessarily say, "I want to be number two, I want to be number one." But oftentimes, also, other startups are built with the goal of being acquired. And I think the you, I, I wouldn't fault an entrepreneur for that. I would be asking more, hey, so um, why why isn't maybe the Deutsche Telekom uh, or the SAP of this world buying a, a startup more? And that's something I, I'm just also curious about. I think we we I think when we deal with talk about acquisitions, I think it's very important to 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 keep in mind that it's, acquisitions are of course an integral part of a startup ecosystem, and the, the data shows us that a, a founder when he's had a buyout. He doesn't go to the Bahamas. He uh, actually goes back into the ecosystem. There's a lot of knowledge spilled over, a lot of new capital, and acquisitions have a lot of value for the ecosystem in that way. Amazing. Um, it's always the same feeling when we have these conversations. There's a lot more to be said and shared. Uh, almost each topic could be a season per, per se. But I'd like to, to wrap up this, not only this episode, but the season um, with a kind of, a, how can I say, a meta question, let's say that, um, because this is about um, innovation policies. And if you're talking uh, about policies and, and legislation, we are again, as I have tried to, 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 to stress out throughout the season, is again about ways of doing or uh, exploring or playing democracy in a positive note. Um, so I'd like to, to, to ask to, to both of you to, to, to finish this conversation. Um, in your perspective, what, what's possible to, to change? What should shift in, in policy making processes 
in, in order to make this way of doing closer to technology, business and society pace of change. We know it's hard to, 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 to keep the pace or, or close this, um, this, this gap uh, between technology changes and then society, people adoption, and usually in the end of the tail is um, it's politics and, and ways of regulating things. Um, is this a standalone challenge or a broader one, uh, like a, a democracy transformation challenge, where, by the way, technology could be uh, instrumental to, to, to improve the process? I know it's not an easy uh, question to finish. But it's no, like no, to... it's a very difficult one. It's a very difficult because technology um, nowadays uh, not only improve business and change the way we do business and uh, we, we, we deliver service, we pro they change ev everything and also uh, they change our life. The, 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 this uh, smartphone changed completely my, my life uh, 10 years or 20 years, 15 years ago maybe, I don't remember, but it's, it's, it's a difference. But, 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 um, you see democracy is, uh, is not very impact until the moment. Uh, it was impact uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a risky way with fake news and uh, uh, th these kind of problems. But we need to use technology also to improve the way we decide in the parliaments, uh, in the commission, in our governments, uh, with more information, uh, in a faster and easier uh, way, but also a faster way. If we, if we take uh, five years to, to decide on a directive or, or a new regulation, in five years, technology will be completely different. Um, because things are going very uh, in a faster way uh, nowadays, and the, uh, I, I, I am not saying that uh, uh, that uh, representative democracy is condemned to die, but um, it means that it has to adapt itself and using also participatory participative democracy, mechanism, collaboration uh, uh, to, to decide uh, in, in a better way and in a faster and flexible way. Uh, uh, in a flexible way. We need to, to find out how to have more flexible regulation in order they can be adapted to uh, the change uh, in, uh, in, in reality. And uh, this is a very, very, very big challenge um, because uh, here in the parliament, now I'm, I'm at home now, but here in the parliament, we were very conservative before this pandemic crisis. And we change a lot. Now we vote, uh, I, I finished my vote signing in my iPad some minutes ago before starting th this meeting is a revolution for the parliament. I know them, they are very, very, very conservative, much more than the Portuguese government, much more. Um, so, uh, so uh, we need, it, it's why I say we need working together. We need to conserve our autonomy in decision, our independence, but this doesn't mean uh, not working together with technological people, with innovative people that have the knowledge and can help us to design and test uh, new new solution concerning the way we, uh, we, ta we take the decision, the way we, we prepare the regulation and directives at the European level and also at national level, of course. Just lovely to have your perspective being an insider uh, in the parliament, um, sharing uh, uh, this point of view. Uh, thank you, Maria Monel. Benedict, please. I think there, there's some really good ideas there already, but um, something I've, I'm seeing more and more is that um, we really want to make sure that the practitioners uh, have input into the policy making process. So sometimes people from a politics background and association like myself, um, 
are best placed to take a back seat and to let a startup founder explain what they're doing with AI. And that's why we actually are building something called the Rocket Club, uh, where we, which is basically a format where we put MEPs together with startup founders from their ecosystem. And um, I'm also going to encourage you, uh, Ms. Leiter Marquez, to, to join uh, in, in our follow-up because I think that's one of the best ways to make sure that uh, policymakers who are curious um, understand what's going on uh, in their ecosystems, in their in their in their constituencies. One of the big challenges we've put forward for this mandate with our members, like like Vitae, is we want to make sure every MEP knows three startups in his or her constituency, because when you when when that is the case, then uh, there's a lot. It's a lot less likely that decisions are made that are adversely affecting them. So that's one of the the, the key takeaways for, from our side is mm. let's give give space to the practitioners. And please, please, Benedict, be in touch with my with my office. I would like to do that. It's my it's a privilege for me. It's, uh, I like to do that. As minister, I did that very, very frequently. Even two small projects of social innovation, I visit them, all of them. Uh, now they are my, my my friends. They wrote me to the parliament. They are going to come to visit me. Then already, this has been probably the most productive webinar I've uh, had in, in the last month, for sure. Um, <laughs> then I'm also you, you're not to... got a heart. <laughs> and I'm just going to add two more things, uh, building on what, what uh, the Honourable Member said. Uh, one is absolutely to embrace technology as part of the solution. I think, you know, I have little to add to there. Um, AI is part of the solution. Uh, uh, you know, distributed uh, ledger technologies are part of the solution, maybe for voting. Um, so we have a lot, you know, a lot to go when it comes to embracing this. Um, and and um, maybe just to kind of wrap up on the current news, you know, the German presidency of the council started last week. Um, I assume most of your viewers are Portuguese. Um, the next presidency of the Council of the EU is the Portuguese one. So there's going to be a, a big chance to give an impetus also uh, for us to learn from what's working or what, what Portugal would like to put forward. So I encourage your viewers to... Uh, also get in touch with their elected representatives and to lobby their government to um, you know have, have a strong Portuguese presidency that maybe uh, moves the needle a bit closer towards a more uh, a digital single market in Europe. Portuguese presidents and Portuguese government, digital transformation is a priority uh, as well as climate, of course, but the environment, of course, but digital is a priority. Number two of the government is the minister in charge of digital transformation. So I'm sure you can do things together uh, during the Portuguese presidency here in the parliament or in, in Portugal. Well, on, be, on, on behalf of Betsaia, I couldn't feel uh, more um, happy or proud about this feeling of mission accomplished. If you're trying to, to disseminate the idea of collaborative innovation, uh, we have a tangible outcome here. Uh, that's uh, what we're talking about. Um, it's a beautiful way of, of, of wrapping up uh, this uh, innovation policy season. We'll be more than happy to follow up uh, the news and the outcomes of this conversation. I'm sure that we have a, a very interesting um, group here, not only uh, the ones taking part of this conversation, but also the viewers because we have the media, a member of the European Parliament, and a representative of, uh, an official representative of policy making or support for that uh, in Europe. And, and now, so better as uh, we had a, this is not the topic for that, but we have a very interesting shift from association to um, consultancy, innovation consultancy company, but we keep supporting for sure uh, the, the entire ecosystem as part of our mission. Um, so for you that, uh, that are watching this episode. Uh, this was a um, better cast on innovation policies. Be sure you'll be informed about the next steps of this conversation. This was a season in partnership with Google. Um, stay tuned because there's more to come uh, in the next weeks. Um, thank you again, Benedict, Maria Manuel, Tim, who um, unfortunately had to, to leave. You can follow, recommend, subscribe, give feedback. Thank you so much for your time and involvement. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Benedict. I hope to see you soon. Night, Marcus, and thank you, Alison, as well. Thank you. See you soon.